This is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals. I'm Jamie Scott Okataya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual roundtable. We are bringing together top industry and educational experts talking about topics important to our industry in our monthly series available right here on the JSA TV YouTube channel as well as on JSA Radio, the only telecom and tech podcast available on iHeartRadio. These monthly roundtables lead us up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our industry networking events, the Telecom Exchange. Next one up is June 21st to the 22nd in downtown New York City. And then the next one after that is November 14th through the 15th at the Montage Beverly Hills in Los Angeles. More info at thetelecomexchange.com. Today's topic is empowering education through broadband. And it's garnered a lot of support. We're really welcome uh, and pleased to have our live audience here today. And thank you also for those who are watching us on demand. This roundtable is brought to you on our JSA video platform, which allows our panelists to log in virtually. And today we are spanning the country from Atlanta to Los Angeles in these streaming live video feeds, care of our partners, BCS Global. So thank you, BCS. And let's get started. I'm honored to introduce our guest moderator, Dr. Scott Wilkinson. He's a veteran in our industry for over 30 years, working with technologies and solutions ranging from fiber to the premises to long haul transport. He is a well-known consultant and analyst in telecom. He's also the senior portfolio marketing manager of ECI Telecom, and of course, a guest lecturer and mentor at Georgia Institute of Technology. It should be noted that Georgia Tech, as many of you know, has historically been a leading university at the forefront of broadband-driven education and research. Dr. Wilkinson, thanks for being with us today, and please do us the honors of introducing our expert panelists. Thank you, Jamie. Glad to be here. As, uh, as Jamie said, let's start off by introducing uh, the panel, and I'll let you introduce yourselves. Mary Beth, if you'd like to go first. Hello, I'm Mary Beth Thomas, and I am the principal at Hilliard A. Wilbanks Middle School in Habersham County, uh, Mount Airy, Demarest area of Georgia. Great, thank you very much. And Paul? Hi, I'm Paul Belk. I'm President and CEO of MGN. We're a fiber optic network spanning over 1,600 miles throughout Northeast Georgia and into Western North Carolina with connections to uh, major tier cities like Atlanta, Ashburn, and Chicago. All right, thank you, Paul. And finally, but not least, Marcy? I'm Marcy Powell. I'm Chair Emerita and past president for the United States Distance Learning Association. I do educational consulting. My background is as a teacher and administrator, and a million dollar and $10 million grants changed my career towards online and distance learning. Great. Thank you all three for <clears throat> very much for being here. We have some questions we'd like to talk about, but we'll make this as informal as possible and keep it as a roundtable. So the first question is, how is the educational community leveraging networks to increase the level of student engagement and participation? And Paul, if you'd like to go first. Well, it's a, it's a great question because uh, Mary Beth and I both know that um, we, we seem to be pretty much on the, on the leading edge of, of, uh, of communities that have seen broadband networks come, come in, overbuilds, come into the community, uh, meaning overbuilding the incumbent so you actually get these robust broadband networks. And um, where we're at right now is we're in the state of adoption. So the, the pipes are there. And, and now the schools have to make decisions on, all right, what is going to best, uh, how am I best going to leverage these connections out to the outside world? What resources do we need to bring in? And likewise, what do we need to ship out? Because it is a two-way street for a broadband connection. Um, what we're seeing right now is um, they're leveraging it for distance learning, whether it be move on when ready programs going into collegiate level uh, learning while still at high school, and then exposure to the outside industries. And I would add to that, uh, at the middle school level, we've had several opportunities for the students to travel the world without having to leave the classroom. And that's a phenomenal opportunity, especially since we are a Title I or low-income school. The students are given opportunities that they would never be able to afford without such technology. 
And I would add to that that with the broadband, with technology heading the direction it has, it's so robust and so powerful. Uh, the content experts that Mary Beth and Paul are talking about, the connection to the community and to businesses is of paramount importance. And there's so many open educational resources, OERs, and content uh, for every discipline that's available. Mm -hmm. And to, without the broadband, it wouldn't be possible to leverage that into the classrooms, whether it's K-12 or higher ed. And so I really think the uh, power of the broadband is, um, is so important. And we're very blessed to have had E-rate in the United States and other um, federal funding and organizations like North Georgia Network that make sure it goes the last mile to reach everyone. I travel all over the world and I see how difficult it is to teach in third world countries without access to the technology or to, and if you have the technology then you can't use it because you don't have the network. Thanks, good points all. Um, the second question is, is there a divide in education based on the lack of or surplus of broadband in a specific area? And Mary Beth, I'll let you start that one. Um, I believe so, I would, I would say yes. I've been in our system for over 20 years now, and until uh, the broadband was made available, we didn't see anything like this. We, we haven't had these opportunities, but now we can link up with our, our local colleges. Um, we can partner with uh, systems for our ESOL students, our students who are not um, native English speakers. Um, it's been a, a tremendous growth opportunity for a community like ours, which is mostly a rural area. I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, the, we continue to talk about, you know, back to your last question about how are we leveraging it and, you know, if you are leveraging it, then what is the difference between um, a school that has it, the haves and have nots, if, if you will. And um, for Habersham County Schools, they are now, they are, they're, they're on one side of, a, of an unfortunate divide in the, in the United States, which is uh, many schools still do not have sufficient broadband even to do remote testing or to do uh, the type of distance learning applications that will provide additional opportunities. Um, so what I see is the urban centers even have issues with broadband connectivity. It's, it's not just within rural centers. So but I think there's an instinct uh, within just people in general to be reluctant to adopt technology that is going to make life a little, uh, not, not a little, but a lot easier. And um, so I think there's a kind of a, a, a period of time where uh, the, the technology, the broadband is going to be available and there's going to be an adoption process. It's going to have to, it, it, it's going to take a couple of years for um, us to really see the applications that require the broadband take off. Because uh, right now we're seeing not not a, not pushback, but you get the broadband connection, and then there's crickets. You, people aren't you don't you don't use it, and um, so it, I think it's also we're going to have to work with our new you know obviously the 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 new folks that are being educated and coming in to 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 educate our our children are they're going to be uh, less reluctant to utilize technologies. And so it, it, there's a generational gap perhaps as well. Yeah, I was going to say you can build it, but they don't necessarily come. Um, yeah. A, because, well, in the past, and, and, you know, I can go back 18 or 20 years when I was at a district where we were named the Lighthouse District for Technology Integration. Um, and we began to train, that was the $10 million grant, was to train all the schools across Texas, school districts that were over 50% economically disadvantaged. One of the most important keys to that great divide that you mentioned, Scott, is that the, the broadband, having enough broadband, and then the proper training um, and professional development for faculty to know how to integrate it. Paul brings up a very good point that uh, we're growing uh, the new teachers coming out of our universities today and system today are much more prone to use the technology in, in the classroom. Uh, but a lot of that is awareness and 
a lot of that is changing the way we've always done things. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if you look at higher ed and uh, some of the leaders that are really changing even to competency-based education, informal and formal learning. There's so many things that are happening now with broadband and with the technologies that run over it um, that you're in a position, we're all in a position where we just have to try to push towards making sure we've reached the very last mile and it's not just a half a meg up and three megs down, which is not, a, which is very limiting. Um, uh, so that broadband is so critical and then that training to make sure that they all know it's available and what you can do with it today. Mm -hmm. Very good points. Um, the next question um, is more for the telecom providers on here. What do K through 12 and university professionals need from the telecom partners? What do you need from the telecom partners to deliver a top line education for 2016, for 2017, for the future? And Marcy, why don't you start us off on that? Well, I don't know if you know this, but I did used to work for AT&T for about four years. I was director of educational advocacy. So I've been on the classroom side, the telecom side, uh, and, and the um, technology side. And so I think what's so important is that we all work closely together. What we need is that um, support. Um, in some cases, it's monetary. In some cases, it's technology. Um, and that, that to take, for a telecom partner, education needs the telecom partner, the provider, to take out all the hassle, to mm -hmm. uh, make it much easier to use, but to understand the use cases that we're going, what are we using it for? Um, a, for example, what we're doing right now is synchronous video. And if the telecom partner is not giving priority to the video, uh, we wouldn't have the experience that we're having right now. Um, and so for 2016-2017, there's three things that I see that we need. And that is to really uh, to work together so that we remove as much hassle out of, um, of doing this, that, and that we support the pedagogical change and the transformation of education that might be with uh, technology companies or telecom companies tweaking and changing some of their capabilities and the ways they do things. Uh, and sometimes it's something like AT&T supporting Georgia Tech with their Masters in Computer Science. Uh, and that is such a game changer worldwide that's being looked at. Uh, and that couldn't have happened without that partnership. And from the education perspective, I would say uh, awareness would be huge. Um, that, that piece of communication with the school systems to make available, this is what we can do for you. And had we not been a pilot opportunity, we wouldn't have known what the opportunities were out there. So that's been a tremendous asset to be a pilot school to be able to utilize such technology. I, I'd have to say from the, from, from the provider standpoint, what, what NGN did going on four years ago, we created what's called an education exchange. And it was a 10 gigabit proprietary network to be utilized solely by um, K-12 systems that connected to it. <clears throat> and then whomever would connect to that exchange, whether it be a university system, a tech school, an industry, they would uh, be able to utilize that that common network in order to make proprietary connections that were sufficient to to um, to carry the the HD streaming or or high definition environments that we seek so much. It's it's just really what we want is is to get to the the most uh, personal uh, you know experience that we can, short of uh, of being in front of someone. But um, where I really see things changing is when industry and education um, start collaborating with each other and I think you know Marcy's starting to make starting to make the connection of we need to cooperate well what does that mean it means that the industries within a local region have to start advising and likewise the educational systems have to be listening to say what do you need out of us and we'll produce that for you well in order to do that and to bridge that gap 
I believe that the either the industry or the upper or higher educational opportunities for those K-12 students needs to be pre present and virtually present within that system prior to them graduating. And they need to have that exposure early. Um, there are a lot of different examples of how that can be leveraged. Um, here in Northeast Georgia, we have a shortage of CNC operators and CNC operators are, they, they're necessary to, in, in order to produce certain, um, certain fabrications uh, in order to produce manufacturing for automobiles and airlines and, and so forth. Well, our tech school right now is focusing on welding and, and um, I think that if we start to provide these connections between the industry and the, the educational systems, uh, you know, we won't have these unfortunate uh, when we're starting to deliver folks to the marketplace from the educational systems and, and there's not a match for what the community requires technology can take take a, can be a remedy for that all right the next question uh, we'll start with Mary Beth on this one because the question is what are K through 12 institutions and universities doing today to be cutting edge to be uh, looking at the edge of the of, of what technology can do for them and what do educational leaders need from telecoms today in order to push through that cutting edge forward towards tomorrow? I would say the opportunities um, and from what's been described today the opportunities are there. Um, I think it's building the bridge of awareness um, from from both ends to uh, let the institutions know this is what we can do for you and then just giving them the opportunity. And what are you doing today with, with uh, the technology that's available? Uh, right now, we're doing several um, interactive lessons. We've traveled to uh, different countries with the students. The students are working from uh, cross-curricular writing. A, a class may start a writing here and continue it with a student in Ohio. Uh, we're visiting the Holocaust Museum of Louisiana, where an entire grade level gets to take a virtual trip in one day without leaving the classroom. Um, visited the state capitol, interacting with government officials all of those types of things that never would have been afforded to, to our students. Yeah. Great. All right, so same question for the other panelists um, about what's being done today that's cutting edge and what do uh, educational leaders need from telecoms today to push forward? Well, well I think that, you know, Mary Beth was very, uh, very complete in, in her response to that. And for, for us, what we've been trying to enable uh, schools like, uh, that, that Mary, Beth, Mary Beth runs is we, we've, we've tried to provide the highway and what she's saying is, is that's not sufficient and it's not. She's correct. You've got to bring a full solution to the table to the school systems because school systems are already, you know, they're tapped out for as, for as far as resources both to educate the student and the bench strength that they've got within their technology resources, they're, they're, they're to their max. So you've got to really come alongside education and ask the question, how can I make this easy for you? How can I push the button and it works? And, and, and that's really what, what consumers, as a, from, that's what I see from, from education standpoint is, you know, don't provide me with a solution and then you know, tell me that I'm going to have to take some courses in order just to use it. So um, I think it's having a, a packaged opportunity where you take out all the guesswork for, for the educators. Because, you know, they're, they're in the business of educating. They're not in the business of figuring out how to stream video. They just need to push the button and it works. I would agree with that. There's so many technologies today, Scott, that are being incorporated in education K through through 20, um, and whether it's augmented reality, virtual reality, I love the new Microsoft HoloLens that's coming out and what Case Western Reserve University has done with it with anatomy and physiology and being able to see the different systems of the body step out and the heart uh, turn and I can see it pumping and really have a 3D experience of that um, and they're applying those the VR to so many uh, different technologies, or different disciplines today and use cases. 
Um, and then you look at artificial intelligence and what that's providing uh, with, um, I love, how many of us love to pick up our phone and be able to ask Siri something and she gives us directions somewhere. Um, to be able to use that AI machine learning and artificial intelligence and natural language processing uh, to be able to uh, ask, uh, ask my device where on campus I go to get financial, uh, to talk to an uh, academic advisor or financial support, or where is the link to click, you know, what, any of those support things that we need, like Paul was talking about making it easy. There's so many technologies out there we're using from the streaming that he mentioned in video to the other um, technologies that are there. Uh, I'm here in New Orleans right now at the online learning conference uh, OLC Innovate and with all of these people here showing us the amazing ways and pedagogical ways that they're implementing the technologies into the curriculum or transforming the learning environment for the students. They are amazing ways that require a lot of bandwidth and require some expertise and in a lot of cases partnerships and those collaborative things that Mary Beth was talking about and those opportunities uh, from content providers and museums and science centers and subject matter experts and the business world being able to provide those into the classroom. Um, but what uh, I really particularly think what we need from telecom companies is we're doing good at getting the broadband to the district, to the campus. What we need is at the last mile to the homes. You know, there's a um, school district in the northeastern part of the United States where they've loaded all of their buses with Wi-Fi routers and they drive them out to the mobile home parks and park them so that those students who have their iPads, they have a one-on-one -on -one iPad, every student in the district has an iPad, they can continue their learning at home. And with adaptive learning technologies that are out there, with the ability to personalize that learning environment, uh, with these uh, companies that have created tools for us where students, we, we can determine where the gaps are, can provide the content specifically to fill those gaps, um, this is game changing for education. Game changing. So it doesn't work well if they have a device that cannot connect when they're home. And so I would challenge uh, our broadband or telecom companies to consider the very rural parts of the United States and of the state of Georgia and other states and how they can, what could they do to reach that community and provide that access. Mm -hmm. um, rather than us having to outfit school buses and drive them there and park them until midnight. Yeah. So you answered the last question pretty well, um, which was, how do you think broadband integration education can help lead to the promotion of broadband in general, especially in underserved areas? I think that's exactly what you were talking about. Paul, did you want to add to that? Well, I, I just... Um, it's funny technology. I was just sitting here and I received a note from from someone that you know, as we were sitting here, uh, reminding me that our schools were functioning on 40 megabits, meaning the entire school system was functioning on 40 megabits, and now they have a gigabit to to the internet. And there the there's a an idea that. When you function from a position of scarcity, it modifies your behavior. And so you end up only thinking at a certain level. You think in limitations. However, when you're provided with um, an amount of abundance uh, for, for, for broadband, then your, your thoughts about what you can do with it start, start to be positioned. What, you know, it's unlimited. But when you have a threshold that you don't want to bump your head against, you're going to keep your head down. And you're not going to push and try and drive uh, technology into a school system because, quite frankly, it's not going to work. So, you know, there, there's that dynamic is you, we need to start functioning from a position of abundance and not scarcity. Great. Mary Beth, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? 
Well, of course, I have to throw in the student perspective once again. Um, awareness is huge, and when students have something in their hands that they've tried new that they think is awesome, the, the excitement is going to grow from there. It's going to pass to their families. They're going to be talking about it. They're going to want those opportunities for everyone they come in contact yeah. with. And same with the teachers in the classroom. When they have these opportunities, they're talking it up with teachers at other schools, and, and it's yeah. just going to explode. So those opportunities are key. I want to first of all thank all of you for being here. Um, I really have learned a lot today. I think this was a great discussion. I'll hand it back over to Jamie to close us out. And thank you, Dr. Wilkinson, for moderating our Empowering Education Through Broadband Roundtable and for our esteemed panelists for your thoughtful insights. I love that we ended on, you know, making our students really um, see and do greater things by emboldening them with um, the abundancy of broadband. So great, great end thought. Thank you, audience, for joining us. If you want to see this and other monthly virtual roundtables on demand, plus our calendar for upcoming roundtables, both virtually and at Telecom Exchange, go ahead and check out jamiescotto.com and thetelecomexchange.com. And if you'd like your C-Level to be featured here next, go ahead and email us at pr at jamiescotto.com. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom. Until next time, happy networking. Thank you.